Light in the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum typically causes vibrational excitation of molecules. It causes the bonds in molecules to stretch and bend and wag and do all kinds of motions that don't involve breaking any of the bonds really, but do get the atoms moving. And infrared radiation is associated with heat for this reason. Infrared radiation causes these vibrations that manifest themselves as heat to us. And just as we think of the electronic energies in atoms and molecules as quantized, there are particular energy levels for the electrons in molecules, vibrational levels are also quantized and discrete. There are these discrete energy gaps between vibrational energy levels. And what infrared light can do upon absorption, if it has an energy that matches a gap, between two vibrational levels, it can cause a molecule to go from a lower energy to a higher energy vibrational state. Roughly speaking, this corresponds to more vigorous oscillations. So while in a lower energy state, maybe a, a bond is only vibrating with you know, relatively small amplitude, at a higher energy vibrational state, that amplitude goes up. And here, I'm exaggerating quite a bit, but you get the idea that as infrared light is absorbed, these vibrations get more vigorous. And of course, the photon of infrared radiation disappears, essentially, and we can detect that in a spectroscopy experiment. And that excess energy that the molecule picks up as a result of absorption of infrared photons is quickly dissipated as heat. So in a typical infrared spectroscopy experiment, we scan a range of wavelengths of energies of infrared light, and when the wavelength matches one of these gaps, we get an absorption. And that absorption is detected as a dip in the infrared spectrum where the light is absorbed, and the amount of transmitted light, which is actually typically what we plot in an infrared experiment, goes down. Now, Molecules can vibrate in a variety of ways. We'll primarily be focused on what are called stretches, which corresponds to a bond vibrating or stretching like a spring. But bonds can also bend, they can twist, and they can wag, and you'll also see these kinds of motions in infrared spectra. However, these tend to be lower energy motions, and as we'll see, they show up in a region of the spectrum that we tend not to care as much about because it ends up being a mess of peaks due to the large number of these types of lower energy bends and wags and twists available to most large organic molecules. So we're gonna focus on stretching, and, and to model stretching, we're gonna use this idea of a spring. This actually gives us great insight into how vibrational frequency, the frequencies of these vibrations, which correspond to these energies. Remember, this delta E corresponds to a stretching frequency and a frequency of light absorbed. That stretching frequency depends on the masses of the atoms involved, as well as the strength of the bond connecting the atoms in an intuitive way, if we know a thing or two about springs. So we're gonna look at a spring as our basic model of how bonds behave in infrared spectroscopy. Before we get there, a few words about the infrared spectroscopy experiment. So the first thing is, different bonds and different functional groups are associated with different vibrational frequencies. In this figure on the right, we see the difference between a CH bond and a CO bond. For reasons that will become clear in a second when we talk about the harmonic oscillator model, a CH bond has a higher vibrational frequency than a CO bond and a greater delta E, greater energy gap between vibrational levels as a result than a CO bond. The CO bond has a lower stretching frequency and a smaller delta E as a consequence. And so we we'll see, for instance, CH bonds showing up up here at the relatively high frequency side of the infrared spectrum. That's for historical reasons on the left-hand side. And we'll see the CO bond stretch show up at a much lower frequency um, here around 1,000 wave numbers. And so we can vary the frequency of infrared light incident on the sample. We get these different peaks, and these different peaks are diagnostic of various types of bonds and various functional groups in the molecule.
Now, just as a note of uh, analytical chemistry here, in a so-called Fourier transform infrared spectrometer, which is the most common type today, we actually irradiate the sample with all frequencies at once and then do some math, the Fourier transform, to kind of deconvolute the response to a frequency spectrum like this. And note that in an infrared spectrum where you see a trough or a dip, this corresponds to light absorption because percent transmittance is plotted on the y-axis here. In the remainder of this video, we're going to talk about how we model bond stretching as basically a classical spring using Hooke's Law. This is a pretty simple and pretty intuitive model. We're actually going to look at a simulation of a spring in a second to start to build this intuition that tells us about the relationship between the stretching frequency and two important parameters related to the bond, the masses of the atoms involved and the strength of the bond. So Hooke's Law classically says that basically the force on a spring that is compressed or stretched is proportional to the displacement of the spring from its equilibrium position. And from this, we can derive the oscillating frequency of a classical spring, and that oscillating frequency, nu, fits this equation. Now, I don't want to go through the derivation. I just want to point out the important variables in this equation and what they tell us about how to think about mass and bond strength or spring stiffness, if you like, and the oscillation frequency. So this k value is the force constant. It's basically how much force um, we need to cause a particular displacement, delta x. And for a molecular scale bond, a typical value for, the, for this is something like 500 newtons per meter for a single bond, with roughly a little bit less than a doubling for a double bond and a little bit less than a tripling for a triple bond. And then the mu here is related to the masses of the atoms on either end of the spring or either end of the bond. As, uh, as one would have it. And it's called the reduced mass. It's equal to 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2. Or if you do a little bit of fractions math, you get this expression, m1 times m2 divided by m1 plus m2. And the idea of reduced mass really is this is going to overweight the more massive of the two atoms involved in the bond massively, pun intended. Uh, so, so basically, if you have a, a bond with very skewed masses, say an H on one end and a Br on the other, the reduced mass will be very, very close to the mass of the bromine. And this reflects the observed vibrational frequency or the vibrational frequency of the spring or bond in this model. Reduced mass does go up with mass, and so you can think of it as a rough measure of the masses of atoms involved in the bond. Now, from this equation that relates the vibrational frequency to these variables, we can recognize a couple of things. This vibrational frequency increases with the force constant, with k, and it decreases as the reduced mass goes up. Now let's take a look at a simulation of a classical spring to get a sense of how this works. First, let's take a look at the effect of a change in mass. Say we go from 50 grams on one spring to 250 grams on the other, and we set these oscillating. It's very clear that the lighter mass is oscillating at a much higher frequency than the heavier mass. And this is a direct consequence of Hooke's Law and this harmonic oscillator model. Now, if we stop these and we equalize the masses, let's put 100 grams on both ends now, and let's look at what happens when we change the spring stiffness. So say I've got a stronger bond in the case on the left. So I've got a very large spring constant. You can actually see the spring thicken up a little bit, indicating it's a stiffer spring. And I've got a looser spring uh, in the position on the right. Now if I set these oscillating, watch what happens. The frequency of the stiffer spring is a bit higher than the frequency of the looser spring. And actually, let's exaggerate this difference even more. I'm going to crank this all the way down and take these both to approximately the same displacement so that we can see this a little more clearly. And very clearly here, the stiffer spring, the stronger bond, the higher force constant, the greater bond order is associated with the greater vibrational frequency. And these ideas, although we're looking at mechanical springs here, apply very well in the molecular world and the world of infrared spectroscopy as well.
So we just took a look at a simulation showing how the force constant of a spring and the masses involved affect the oscillating frequency of the spring or the vibrational frequency of the bond if we're taking this over to the molecular world of bonds and atoms. When it comes to molecules, as the bond strength increases, the infrared stretching frequency or the vibrational frequency increases. This corresponds to an increase in the force constant, quote unquote, of the bond. And so for a series like a CN single bond versus double bond versus triple bond, we would expect an increase in the observed stretching frequency with this increase in bond order going from a single to a double to a triple. And it's not quite linear because the force constant appears under the square root symbol here, but we could do some math to get approximately the vibrational frequencies associated with each of these bonds, and we would definitely see an increase in the vibrational frequency. And this is observed in real molecules. Amines tend to have lower stretching frequencies than nitriles, for example. As we increase the masses of the atoms, the stretching frequency decreases, and we can very much see this in infrared spectra. For example, if we consider a carbon-sulfur bond versus a carbon-oxygen bond versus a carbon-hydrogen bond, in this series, the vibrational frequency is increasing from CS to CO to CH as the mass of the atom involved decreases. The lighter mass oscillates at a higher frequency, both when it comes to springs and bonds.